Welcome to today's podcast interview. I brought on Gary Garth. Gary, welcome. Thank you so much for having me. I think you're officially my first guy from Denmark. But for those that are new to you, <laughs> please give a little background. Where do you live and what do you do? Yes, absolutely. Originally from Denmark, that's the northern part of Europe, in case anybody wondered. I've been living abroad the last 15 years, and I currently reside in Medellin, Colombia. Uh, I uh, am an angel investor, serial entrepreneur, uh, work on a couple of different projects. Right now, I'm very focused on a growth accelerator company that's called Elevate.io, where we work with addiction treatment centers and mental health care providers, uh, basically help them grow the facilities. Yes. All right. But I, I want to give a little bit of background on how you got to where you are, because Number one, you shared with me that you made your first million dollars at the age of 23. So you in, you know, your latest book, Zero to 100 Million, a lot of people have a chokehold around money, live in lack, fear and scarcity. So I want to pick your brain and figure out how you are thinking and being different because we all have access to that, I believe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think I've always been very risk averse and as I mentioned been a serial entrepreneur uh, started my first business right out of high school when I was 19 years old uh, was a kind of lucky to that extent that I sold that business we were selling DVD players when that was a new thing back then um, and, and then jumped into the next business I also had certainly had a, a series of failures it's not that I've been one <laughs> just exit, exiting one company after the other. Uh, but I made some money along the road. Um, and, and I've been always particularly good in, in sales, business development, marketing companies. That's been my strong suit. And that's basically the, the blueprint I put in in my book, The Serial 100 Million, and how I've done that recently. And I collaborated very closely with the last 10 years with Google and Microsoft, companies like that, and enable companies to, to, to leverage their platforms and, and grow. Um, but I think a lot of it, when people are living out of scarcity, it's, it's a lot about taking risk. So to give you some specific examples, back when I was uh, 29 years old, uh, I was quote unquote successful. I, I, I started a couple of companies. I was living in a big penthouse apartment and uh, made a lot of money. I was partner in a radio station, Radio Energy, the, the largest radio network in Europe, in the Danish division though. Um, and an opportunity came across where uh, this consultant for the Danish government said, Gary, you're very good at marketing and sales. Why don't you take your skill set across the Atlantic? Why don't you go to Nicaragua and target United States bus uh, businesses in the United States instead of just Denmark, which is a, a little close country with, with 6 million people, right? It's, it's limited in that sense. And Europe is difficult to do business because there's so many different languages. So I was like, what the heck is Nicaragua? Is that in Africa? I didn't even know where it was, right? But fast forward a couple of months, um, I had sold my apartment, I uh, sold the company and, and all my belongings and was uh, moved to Nicaragua uh, and then went on to to start a business that was grew to become an 5,000 fastest growing company four years in a row and eight figure uh, revenue, 300 employees, 5,000 clients, 300 million under management. And that would not have been possible if I wouldn't have taken the risk and said, okay, let me step out of my comfort zone and take a risk. Everybody told me I'm, I'm a fool, right? Why are they going to Nicaragua? It's a, a third world country uh, on the yeah. brink of poverty. There's a political unrest, et cetera. But I just saw the glass half full. I saw, that, hey, nobody else is here. So maybe it's an opportunity for me to hire a lot of talented people that are underemployed that I can develop uh, and then have a very affordable, high quality solution that I could cater to US. All right. So that's just to give an example. I think what what's sometimes needed if you want to uh, you want to scale a business and, and grow. Okay, I want to back you up on that. I've been to Nicaragua. Uh, I mean, there's yeah. parts of Asia, Bali, Thailand. I think they're pretty dumpy as well. But Nicaragua is by far the most third world country I've been a part of. And I think Americans, especially, <laughs> I, I want to be kind about this, but Americans don't understand, uh, you know, how lucky and privileged we are, all the things that we have when like Nicaragua, 
dirt roads, cement slabs, sleeping on a mattress if they're lucky kind of thing. So for Amen. you to not only get out of your comfort zone, you saw opportunity like that takes a different level of mind. So really what I'm trying to get is like to get where where did you learn these inherent business strategies and like you have a big picture mind where did you get that uh, good question i think i've always been uh, very intrigued by uh you know reading books self-biographies people who established their own companies and saw that sometimes you know you start to see the patterns of what it takes so to have a vision, so to speak, and I couldn't put my finger on what particularly made me made me jump on those different opportunities. But um, I again saw the glass as, as half full. Um, the actual story was that uh, the Danish government back then had a uh, had a program to fund third world countries indirectly instead of giving it to governments that may have may or may not have a reputation of being corrupt. Um, they would instead funnel some money through companies. If you're quote unquote successful in Denmark and had like I think plus thirty employees and over X amount of revenue and years of establishment, you could qualify if you took uh, skill set services that would drive innovation, make a social impact, create jobs, and that that will thereby fuel the economy in the country. So we apply for that. We could get upwards a million dollars in investment subsidy. So I was like, what? a new adventure. I'm tired. I'm almost thirty years old. I'm a board, I need to try something else. We came over there and did not get the funding, uh, although we were all in because there was political unrest at that point and the embassy shut down, etc. So you also have to be able to face the adversity and say, okay, I'm all in no matter what it takes. I didn't want to go back to Denmark with a tail between my between my legs and say, okay, I failed. I wanted to prove everybody wrong. So for actually for nine straight months, my former partner, myself, we went to the office at, at midnight and uh, we would call Danish businesses. There's an eight hour time difference. So we would be talking with Danish businesses uh, and sell solutions, radio advertising to fund the Nicaraguan project. And then we would continue working until like three, four o'clock until it crash. 15 espressos later, sleep, and then start all over just to fund the project. So it's not just butterfly and, and sunshine, and <laughs> uh, but Unless you take those risks and are ready to face adversity, you won't get the reward either. Is my point. Okay, something I feel that you noted that I don't think a lot of people do. So even when I'm working with coaching clients, before I take a new client on, I ask them, are you interested in creating change in your life or are you committed? And like uh -huh. you shared with your business stuff, you have to go all in. So creating an amazing life you can't dabble you can't tinker what would you offer people like to create if they want the wealth if they want the abundance if they want the health of whatever they're seeking how do you get them to commit and go all in rather than just like test it mm -hmm. well i think that's why 97 percent of businesses they cease to exist right yeah um and only a small percentage of those ever make it beyond a million dollars in and your recurring revenue. So most is actually just lifestyle business, et cetera. And I think it's because people have not, they're not, they don't have that sense of clarity. Like it has to be a must, like you say. I mean, it has to be like non-negotiable. No matter what it takes, I'm going to push through this. Uh, I'm going to seek the answers. I'm going to find the resources. I'm going to, I'm going to make it happen one way or the other, right? Um because otherwise, uh, this, you pretty much you, the statistics are not in your favor, right? You're up against the wall. Yeah. Are you familiar with David Goggins? Oh, yeah. Yeah, okay. he's actually published a book in, in the same scribe media that I published, Linecrest Publishing. The reason I just brought him up, he came to mind because I feel like what you're really sharing is mental resilience. What mm -hmm. the 3% have, or, you know, some people talk about the top 1%, what the small percentage of people have that the rest of the people aren't implementing is mental resilience. Can we talk mm -hmm. about that? And what does that mean in business and life? Yes, of course. Yeah. So it all depends on the given scenario, but but I think like in order to get that resilience, the guy, maybe an incredible 
big driver behind you know your motivation and your intentions right it's almost got to stem from your personality something you got you feel lack of something you want to achieve some perception you want to change about yourself or you have been uh, impacted in some shape or form by an industry a situation some circumstances that you want to change that has to be the level uh, in order to get that resilience i would say because otherwise you know, you're going to come to a certain stage that is this worth it? Uh, am I over-investing? Am I sacrificing too much of family, friends, economy, or my certain, like my my, my life? Am I going to wake up 10 years from now? So unless you have that, then I don't think you can push through it. So I'm sure you preach this as well. I'm not preaching to the choir here, but it's, the why has to be strong, right? And that's setting that, putting that in place right out of the, right out of the gate, with whatever you want to pursue because otherwise then you're being pulled instead of just pushed in that direction right yeah what i shared with you is uh i have experienced for me business has been personal development on steroids and there have definitely <laughs> been that. times when it's like fuck this this is too hard maybe i'm not made for this you know a lot of people face limiting beliefs and disempowering beliefs and talk themselves out of greatness instead of mm -hmm. into it but i i got to the point of like I would be a horrible employee. I can't go back to corporate. So for me, as Tony Robbins would say, you got to burn the fucking boats. Yes. Like there's no going back. You have to draw a line in the sand. So I would love uh -huh. to hear from you also on that note, you know, like how, how do you keep that energy and the momentum going? Yeah. That's my question. Yeah. Uh, I I don't think there's nobody's perfect in that sense, and I I'm also depressed or unmotivated at times, and 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 I have my slumps. What drives me a lot is that I have a strong why now, um, and uh, I use my 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 planner, goals, grid, and greatness. I you know I put a vision board, I put I long term goals, and when I'm doing my weekly planning, I go back and look at my ten year vision and like. Why the heck am I doing this right now? What's the reason behind this madness? Ah, let me just think about that. What would that look like, my ideal life in that scenario that I envisioned or the impact I can make? And that kind of just, you know, I think a lot of people not doing these small little uh, exercises or habits, they, they, you know, they can kind of get off track with, with, you know, what's needed. And then all of a sudden it's easy to give up. So yeah. Um, so that that that's what helps me personally. I think we're all driven differently and we all have different systems and processes. I don't think there's anything that's picture perfect, but that helps me a lot, at least. Yeah. Okay, so I would love to hear from you more, and we can talk about your planner, but kind of what's an average day like? What are your do you have morning rituals? I use the term ritual, not routine, because for yeah. me, what word me can you de derive from routine? Rut. Mm hmm so yeah. what are your morning rituals? Do you have an evening practice, a midday break? Like, what are you doing? Yeah, I, I try to always get up very early, 4.35 a.m. And I'd be at the gym as the very first thing. I try different routines, different just to establish. What works best for me is just physical exercise right out the gate. Not not try to. So I, I changed up the steps in, in my morning ritual many times. But right now, it looks like get up, get my ass to the gym, get pumped. I do some 30 minute cardio while I'm watching some motivational videos or listening to an audiobook, something that gets me a little fired up, or just some, some music, right? And I'm like, I'm already thinking about the day and my goals and all that. So that gets me going. Um, and, and then I come home and then I fill out, you know, my, my I, I write down in my journal, like in the planner, you know, what I'm grateful for, what would make today great. I review my priorities, et cetera. Just a little bit of a high level planning. Uh, and then I try to do 10 minutes of meditation as well, uh, just because so I'm just calm my same down, right? Otherwise, I'm at that point, I'm already jacked up after a couple of espressos and I'm very high energy, you know, let's get shit done. So it helps just to center myself. Okay. Uh, and that's, that's, I try to throw a lot of other things into the equation, but that's what works a lot for me. Um, and then otherwise, then it's a busy day at work. And then when I, when it's nighttime, I try to unwind. I try to not respond to messages after eight eight o'clock. Um, uh, I try to read what chapter if I can get to it, um, and and do ten minutes of meditation again. I typically review a little bit on 
and my planner what like what what was good about the day and just reflect a little bit about that and then what I have to do tomorrow. Um, but for me, the morning ritual is the very most important yeah. part of my, my routine. The reason I want to highlight that is because if you want to call them the top 3%, those people that are living mindfully and intentionally have things in place for the self-care, uh, getting their head right, their energy right. And just like yeah. you, I have found, I used to be, well, when I worked a nine to five, I went to the gym and at night, you couldn't pay me to go now at 5 PM. I couldn't work <laughs> out in those crowds, right. but just like you, I get up, I do meditation to get my, like in the right just feeling peaceful and Zen. And I go to the gym, take care of me. You get it. I love the endorphins and I'm a runner, the runner's high. Like I love that. Then I take on my day. Then my day is about serving and content creation, helping others, but we can't pour from an empty cup. What I wanted to ask you, something you shared with me, because I think this is very important to share quote identity shifts. You know, we have seasons of life. There was a time when you were very ego-driven, more and more and more materialistic, and then you changed your focus into more about contribution. I'd love for you to share that. Mm. Yeah. Um, I think for me, it was always, if I look back at my old goals and and plans that I filled out back then, it sounds like it was always like, get to that, exit, then invest that, then hit X amount of millions. And then I'll be happy, right? Um, and mm-hmm. that was just never the case. That the finish line kept kept moving. And obviously, this a lot of people can recognize this, but for me, even though it's evident, it just didn't hit me in the face before I was like forty years old. And uh, I sold the shares in my last company, and I, I was ki- kind of didn't have to work. Uh, I was living in a big house on the beach, uh, and I was like, "Wait a minute, is that it?" Uh, and and it was all like I was not driven. I was not motivated the last couple of years. And it was like, what what am I doing? My last a- agency, we had like seventeen percent of our portfolio was like personal injury, injury lawyers, for example. And I'm like, how the hell am I helping the world become a better place? Like helping these guys spend hundreds of thousands of dollars on these technology platforms that don't pay any taxes, and then uh, the ambulance changes, etc. Right? I mean. It's just making money, and I was like, I'm, I'm, I was like really depressed, almost right, borderline, and and I had to reinvent my wealth. So when I sold my shares in the company, I uh, I took a year sabbatical year off, and um, I really explored everything. I mean, to the degree that I went to Peru and did ayahuasca for a month, uh, I did uh, iboga, which is a very strong and uh, psychedelic uh, psilocybin in Jamaica. I went all the places where I was like, okay, let me try to open my mind right and ask some questions and have some intention like what should i do what should i do when i grow up and that path led me to what i'm doing now where um i was uh uh, as with the money that i cashed out i was about to invest in two um two addiction treatment centers one in canada one the dominican luxury boutique rehabs uh, helping people with alcohol and, and, and and drug addiction and my friend had just passed my best friend had just passed away um with an od i had some close in my family that was suffering from it so it was was very near to me and i saw the the impact it's not just an addict um it's 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 the family it's the kids it's the mother everybody's suffering around them right everybody wants to help everyone wants to love and they have a disease essentially so difficult to overcome right it's so freaking difficult and then you got big pharma that just want to give you some pills to treat it, right? Treat the symptoms, but not the underlying cause, mm-hmm. right? What's needed. And, uh, you know, prior to that, I was like working with Google and Microsoft. Like I was a big channel partner with them. I was helping them enable other marketing agencies to sell our solutions, basically. So I would see all these like high paid executives and top entrepreneurs and uh, not to say more money, more problems, but typically when you're at that stage, they're all to some extent addicted to something, one shape or form or another. And they just didn't have the answers. And so for me, it was like, I'm going to invest in some addiction treatment centers. I'm going to show that it's not just about, you know, eating the red pill and, and taking big farmers prescriptions to it. There's, there's actually, if you start building a life around, you know, being being healthy, being aware of what you put in your in your in, in your body as for nutrition and you have the right uh, exercising regimen and 
you start practicing gratitude and, and meditating and all these other things that can make actually a big impact because you just ch- start changing your perception. So I was about to launch these centers, then COVID came. And we couldn't fly people out for these centers. So we didn't move forward with that. But but prior to that, I have I just saw that there was a gap because um there's like one out of three Americans currently have, have mental health care, uh, mental mental health issues, right? Either depression, anxiety, or uh, some some short shape or form. And, and there's almost 25 million Americans that are suffering from addiction, and only 10% of those actually go into treatment. So why that gap? That's why I wanted to get into that. And, and that made me then pivot and say, okay, maybe I should start this growth accelerator elevate that I'm doing now to help these facilities make sure that they close the gap. Why are they not at 100% occupancy rate when 90% of people is actually not in treatment? Like, why the heck is that? And then as I start digging into the surface, like they don't have the right demand generation, lead generation. They don't have the right systems in place. They don't have the right processes. So custom acquisition becomes a coincidence. There's not a strategy behind it. And so I said, okay, this is a way for leverage my 20 years of experience, apply it to something that I'm passionate about. And not only, not only can I make money, but I can actually indirectly help millions of people out of suffering. And that's, for me, what gets me out of bed right now, very early. It's a good bit late, but I'm happy as, as ever before. Okay, so there's several things I want to touch on there. The big one is, Gary, Western culture, especially the U.S., is all of, I mean, how big pharma, if it's not, I think it's like a trillion dollar industry. Is that right? The biggest, yeah. So guess what, Americans, if we weren't band-aiding symptoms, that entire industry would crumble, which would Mm -hmm. affect government and politics and everything. So I just, I'm not going to go down conspiracy theories and down that rabbit hole. However, I just want people to realize that by band-aiding symptoms, I also did ayahuasca, pretty cool experience, but by band-aiding symptoms, You're never going to have that inner peace, the freedom, the happiness, fulfillment that you seek. And so it's not about another pill. And the reason everybody numbs out on drugs and alcohol is because there's so much discomfort, right? They're trying to numb the discomfort. And what I understand, especially since 2020, how how lonely and isolated people feel. Mm -hmm. So how can we inspire and motivate people that look, you know, you're very successful financially and in business, but you're very mindful and intentional and kind of what I was thinking when you were sharing about the business, the metaphors you used for systems and processes in business, how can individuals do that in their own life to create a lifestyle? Yeah, that's a great point. I mean, so most successful business people are great at creating processes or delegating and enabling people to do certain actions, self for them, et cetera. You got to just do that for yourself, right? So like we talked about, establishing healthy habits, yeah. prioritizing. Uh, you know, if you have a company and you're establishing quarterly KPIs where you got to hit XYZ growth and so forth, do it for yourself as well. Prioritize reading, prioritize meditating, prioritize you got to... Uh, invest X amount of hours in certain exercise regimen, whatever it may do, quantify it the same way and, and tie it up with, with a purpose. And I think you just accelerate also in business if you do that, because you know, just get a whole different level of energy. What's I found like, I've, I've also been down the hole where I was depressed and unhappy and drinking too much. I was working around the clock and, you know, not living a healthy life. And that does not support your leadership skills or, or, or business abilities. On the contrary, if you get your ass up to the gym and if you're meditating, if you focus, if you do uh, exercise and gratitude, all of a sudden you have a calm, you know, approach and and people pick up on that radiation. I mean, that, that energy is something that draws people to you and good things come with it. It's not that I want to, it's not just about manifestation, but there is something to it. When you have the right intentions and you're working hard and you're doing right, then good things come your way. So um, I, I encourage everybody to to double down on those, those habits. I love what you said to quantify with purpose. 
And when I was living, I call it autopilot. When I was living life in autopilot, going through the motions, saying, you know, rinse, wash, repeat, cheering on Friday, dreading Monday, I was not mindful, intentional, taking inventory, checking in. I didn't have a vision. I didn't have clarity. So what I want to share is just like we have had huge identity shifts and paradigm shifts and and created different realities, everyone else has this ability to. Something I asked you, I'd love for you to share. What is a billboard message you want to share with humanity? Be grateful. And then you told me to enjoy the ride. And here's what I found. Mm -hmm. And I think kind of what you were sharing, that never ending target. I was very, I was living conditionally. I remember I caught myself on vacation, planning my next vacation. (laughs) Not even present. (laughs) So what is something you do to help you stay present and enjoy this ride? And remember, like, we get to be here. We get to do this. Yeah. Uh, To some extent, I take things too seriously always, right? So always, like, concerned about X, Y, C and the ramifications. So far, I'm like, what's the worst that's going to happen? You know, if I feel like doing X, Y, C, I'm going to do it, you know? Um. And, and and just enjoy the ride because you know otherwise you get too like you're just too committed to your to your work to your targets to your tasks to your responsibilities. I mean, because we're all super busy and occupied, and this distractions night to from a.m. to late p.m. Right, it's inevitable. So you just gotta unplug and do like what what's important for me. Like I put in my plan of what's gonna make today great. Not about I gotta close this deal. I gotta land that, that land that agreement. I gotta ace this podcast interview. Screw that. I'll get that done. But like, what are the little things that I'm gonna put? Gonna put a smile on my face. You know, how can I treat myself better? And yes. I think that goes a long way. I love that. And the word that like I'm highlighting and seeing in neon is to unplug. You know, like I very intentionally <laughs> do digital detoxes, even if it's for a day. I was just in um. I went to Cabo for my birthday, but like I put my phone away. Uh I had no distractions. I had no stress. I just was like, I took naps on the beach. Wow. Like that doesn't have to be just vacation. No. Yes. I love that. Okay. So here's, I have a question for you. We've touched on a lot and, you know, depending where people are in their life, what is one key takeaway you want listeners to get? Uh, what can you take away? Oh, that's a big. We talked t- touched so many different topics, right? I um, well, I think if I'm looking at, if I'm thinking on on, on the, a conversation and the the small little patterns, there is would be rituals. Establish some rituals that can empower uh your happiness and the the light the light vision you have right um that goes a long way because we talked a lot about unfulfillment or we talked about addictions or depression or uh you know breaking out of like the the conventional path that we have established like society has established like it's all about whatever you need to do if you need to break those patterns if you need to create a new trajectory for yourself it really boils down to establishing priorities and rituals and then exercise that with discipline. If you do that, sky's the limit. Hold on. How did you just break that down? Well, I I mean, I know this will be recorded, <laughs> but you said two things and then discipline. Break it down to rituals, something, and discipline. I loved how you rituals, said Rituals, yeah, basically breaking it down to establishing the right rituals uh, based on the right priorities, Right. Uh, and then having the the discipline to execute on it consistently. Right? Okay, I got it. Thank you. So I'm very bulleted. Like I see formulas. That's how I'm very visual. So here's for listeners. Here here's what I really got out of this, and I think it's simple, and I think that's key. That changing our life actually is simple, not necessarily easy, but simple. So create rituals, know your priorities, and and that daily discipline. Yes. Much better said. Thank you. Oh, <laughs> love that. Okay. So I'd love to wrap up the interview. I have a few rapid fire questions for you. Okay. What is a quote or motto that you live by? Uh, 
back to my Anthony Robbins, achievement without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Okay, say it again for those in the back. Achievement without fulfillment is the ultimate failure. Mm. Mm. What is a book you're currently reading or highly recommend? Shoe Dog by Phil Knight. They just released a movie somewhat similar to that and the cinemas air to air. Was it, uh, is, is his, it about Nikes or like Air Jordan or something? It's about Air Jordan, but the book I'm referring to, Shoe Dog, is his entrepreneurial ride. And the struggles, the challenges, going to different cultures, traveling to Asia, broken deals, industrial espionage, running out of cash, everything and anything that you will face when you launch your company if you're not that one unicorn. Uh, I love that because it explains how he got through it. And for many budding entrepreneurs, et cetera, it's like, okay, this is just the ride. It's not me. I'm not doing something wrong. This is just expected. It's not easy. So I I, re- that re- I really like that book. Uh, and also has a lot of spiritual zen like He's he's very that. So it's cool. It's, it's a good balance of all those things. I love it. Are you familiar with Robin Sharma? Oh, yeah. I love his books. Yeah. So what I love about I Robin know. Sharma, he he speaks more in like you know five a.m. club, uh, how monks sold his for whatever all those books. What I love about Sharma is that he uh-huh. teaches these spiritual teachings, but like in fables. Yes, and they're really fun stories, but you still get that like mindset and growth. Love that guy. Yeah. That's what it, it no, it's, me. he's he's so good at, at doing those, right? It it resonates with everybody. Everybody yeah. can understand the message, right? Five AM is one definitely one of my favorite books. I'm I'm definitely a five AM club guy kind of guy. All right. Final question. What advice would you give your younger self? <laughs> oh, I would I would send him a laundry list of advice first and foremost. <laughs> one thing. One thing. Double down on your strengths. On try to be something you're not. Double down on your strengths. strengths. Embrace it. Who you are. Oh. Embrace it. Don't try to change well, what society expects from you. Your partners expect you to be. Your parents or whatever. Be be who you are. Just double down. Own it. And if you have certain weaknesses, figure it out. Delegate it. Just be the be- very best at what you could be. And that's what makes you unique. Yes. We need more Garys in this world. Thank you so much for joining me and having this conversation. Thank you so much for having me. This was fun.